This is Catherine Brooks on behalf of the department Politics Inspires interviewing Professor Margaret Macmillan who is a Professor of International History at the University of Oxford and also Warden of St Anthony's College. She is author of the new book The War That Ended Peace, winner of the Political Book Award in 2014. Margaret, given how well trodden this topic is, what compelled you to write this book? What did you feel you were able to add to our understandings of the origins of World War I? Well, I think any historian who does the 19th and 20th centuries, even the 21st century, cannot help but be fascinated by the First World War because it caused such enormous changes. It marked such a break in European and world history. And so it's one of those great sort of issues in modern history, which I think you, you can't help but be fascinated by. And the question, among the many questions about the war, the question of how it started is one that has never really been answered. There's no consensus on how it started. And so when I was asked to do it by a publisher, I thought at first, you know, as you say, it has been very well trodden ground. It's been estimated that in English alone, there's something like 27,000 different things on the outbreak of the war. I thought at first I didn't want to do it. And then I thought, you know, I'd like to try it. I'd like to perhaps bring in some of the new things that have been happening in history. I'm quite good at telling narratives and I'm quite good on people. And I thought I could perhaps use that to help people who won't be familiar with the subject understand how this great event came about and what some of its consequences were. And as I got into it and did more and more research, I became absolutely fascinated. Although they're not great, I think, secrets out there to be found, I don't think they're great caches of documents which will reveal thinking that we don't know about. What has been happening, which makes, I think, it interesting, and perhaps I can add something here, is that historians more and more have been working on things like attitudes, education, value structures, ways of thinking. And I think this can help to illuminate the mental framework of those who had to make the decisions in 1914 whether or not to go to war. Excellent, thank you. Why is it then do you feel that the origins of the First World War continue to be a subject of fascination, possibly above all other events in history, to academics? And why does academia fail to reach a consensus on this most important of events? I think we fail to reach a consensus because it's impossible to reach one. And I don't think we ever will reach one. I mean, it's very, very different from the Second World War, where there is pretty much now a consensus of how that war came about. The trouble with the First World War is that there are so many possible causes. They're interacting. There's so many different players who are interacting. There's so many different levels within countries which are also interacting. And so if you have, for example, the civilian authorities in, in, in countries, but then you also have the military with their own views. You have increasingly the importance of public opinion, which is a new factor in politics. And so the complexity of trying to understand how it was in the summer of 1914 a war broke out is really overwhelming. And I think as you shift your perspectives, you begin to see different things. And so in the 1950s and, and 1960s, there was a lot more interest in military thinking. How did military thinking help to bring the war about? And we are still thinking about that, but we're also shifting. We're beginning to look at things like public opinion, um, like ways of thinking, um, ideas or values or, or, or perceptions such as social Darwinism. And so I think we will always be asking new questions about it. And it's how you fit all those different levels together. And you, you can fit them together and come up with quite different answers. I mean, there have been several books which have come out in the past couple of years about the origins of the First World War and they give very different answers about how their authors think it came about. I think that's inevitable. In your book, you do actually pay a lot of attention to the actors involved, their motivations, the circumstances that influence them. In your opinion, has previous scholarship on World War I emphasised structural factors at the neglect of the actors involved? Well, it's gone back and forth. Um, after the war itself, there was, uh, well, during the war, there was a lot of blame being attached to different players. After the war in the 1920s and increasingly in the 1930s, people began to see it as a structural failure, a failure of the balance of power, for example, um, which simply was, was seen as being inherently unstable and which finally just led to the catastrophe of the, catastrophe of the First World War. I think we've swung back a bit and we're now looking more at the agency of those who, who were in positions of power. Because at a certain point, as the crisis begins to develop in the summer of 1914, there are people in positions of power who have the authority and actually have to say, yes, we will now take the next step or we won't. And so I think in the end, you do have to consider those who actually had to make the decisions, but they're embedded in a much wider context. And of course, they're very much part of their times. And so again, it's, it's balancing between the individual agents and the forces and the structures with which they had to deal.
So in your book, you state that you are seeking to answer the question, why did the peace fail, as opposed to, or in conjunction with, why did the war break out? How do you think that framing your question in that way allowed you to answer different puzzles? Well, what struck me so much about the writing on the first, or a lot of the writing on the First World War, was that because there were so many probable causes, I mean, you can look at everything from nationalism to imperial rivalries, economic rivalries, military planning, all these sorts of things. Because there were so many probable causes, people were slipping into a rather dangerous assumption that the war had to happen. Because it was, you can see the reasons why it happened if you look back. We then, I think some of us tended to make the, I think, logical, um, it is illogical, but the logical fallacy of thinking because there were lots of causes, it had to happen. And so I asked myself, what if it hadn't happened? I mean, in a way, I suppose it was a counterfactual. What if there hadn't been an incident in the summer of 1914, the assassination of the Archduke, which gave the excuse for Austria-Hungary to start taking certain steps and then all much else flowed from that? What if there'd been no incident in the summer of 1914? Would Europe have been more or less pe peaceful by the summer of 1915? And I started to ask also, why was it that Europe, which had enjoyed this extraordinarily long period of peace, in European terms, the period from 1815 to 1914 is one of almost, I say almost, unbroken peace. I mean, yes, there were wars, but they tended to be short, and they tended to between, be between just two powers, and, and they were decisive wars, say between Germany, uh, or the German Confederation and Austria-Hungary, or between the German Confederation and France. And so Europe really, in its own terms, had had a very good century, and it was a century marked by incredible progress, and tremendous economic and, and social and other kinds of progress. And a lot of Europeans had concluded, well before the outbreak of war in 1914, that war was something Europe never did, didn't do anymore. Europe had moved beyond needing war. It's rather like the Europe of today. I mean, we have an assumption that war between nations, between states in Europe, is just not something that is going to happen anymore. It's not the sort of thing we do. And so I thought it was an interesting thing to look at why that very long period of peace didn't last. I mean, why did it suddenly? Why was this sudden rupture in 1914? My own view is that certainly there were the pressures building up, but there were also pressures pushing Europe away from war. There was a very big peace movement and tremendous support for peace among the publics. And, and a public opinion really was now a factor that governments had to take into, into account. And so I want to look at this, how this Europe that was in play, forces for war, forces for peace, what tipped it over in this particular direction. My own view, which of course will be debated because no, we, none of us agree with each other on the First World War, my own view is in the end, it comes down to a very few people making a few very bad decisions. Excellent, that actually leads me on to another question, which is, could you elaborate more on the parallels that you're able to draw between 1914 and today? And do you think there are still lessons that can be learned from the outbreak of the First World War? Well, there's been a lot of parallel drawing lately because we're living through a rather turbulent time in, 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 the, in the present days. I'm always wary of parallels. I think they can be interesting and instructive, but you shouldn't make them too tight. If you say, you know, today is just like 1914, then I think you, you're almost locking yourself into a particular interpretation, which I don't think is a good idea. But yes, there are parallels. I mean, the period before 1914, to take one example, was a period of tremendous globalization. And the period since the 1990s has been a period of tremendous globalization, a tremendous expansion of trade, investment, exchange of ideas, movements of peoples. I mean, that, there are real similarities there. I think you could also argue that the period before 1914 saw a power that had been hegemonic, the British Empire, beginning to feel competition from rising powers, no longer capable of sustaining that hegemonic role, which of course is very expensive and, and costs a lot also in terms of, of, of public support and, and lives, often lives. And I think today we have the United States, which has been a hegemonic power is now being challenged by countries such as China, Brazil, India, countries which are growing economically and in some cases beginning to translate their economic strength into military strength. And these can be difficult periods of transition. Um, for the hegemonic power, it's an uncomfortable moment when it feels itself no longer quite as much in control as it was. And for the rising powers, there's a sense of frustration as they push against the hegemonic power. And so I think, again, there are parallels, but that doesn't mean there's an exact fit between then and now, because we're living in very different worlds. Excellent, thank you. So in the book, you state that peace of a sort came in 1918, but to a very different Europe and world. A hundred years on then, what do you think has been the lasting legacy of World War I, or how could you imagine the world would have been different had World War I not happened in the way that it did? Well, we'll never know, but I think it's at least possible 
that Austria-Hungary might have su survived in some form or another, a very large multinational empire at the heart of Europe, which certainly had its nationalities problems, but also had, I think, a sense of identity and was beginning, I think, some in some cases more successfully than others, others to deal with those national, nationality issues. It might have continued to survive, which would have been a lot better than what followed it, I think. Um, Russia, I think you could argue, might not have had, oh, it would have had some form of transformation, I think. It had very nearly had a revolution in 1905, 1906. But whether it would have had the sort of revolution it had in 1917 is a different matter, because the war really put such tremendous strain on, on the Russian system. I don't think the Bolsheviks would have seized power. They were a tiny little group, a minority group, most of them in exile before 1914. I think it was the war that gave them their opening. So I think a number of things would have been different. I think Europe, which was the dominant part of the world before 1914, probably could not have remained in that position forever, but the war certainly accelerated the decline of Europe, the, bank, the, the, the spending that European states had to do to, to maintain themselves in the war and really left them weakened economically. Uh, the war sped up the disappearance of the big European empires. It sped up the rise of the United States. So I think in all those ways you can see a really lasting impact on the 20th and 21st centuries. Thank you. Okay, so in the book you mention quite a lot about the role of honour. Um, and playing, that playing a significant role in the outbreak of the war. Could you elaborate on that? Well, one of the things I became quite interested in were the ways in which people thought about themselves and thought about their countries. And often you got people transposing values that they themselves had or their class had or their particular branch of the government had onto the state as a whole. And it was a time when people still talked in terms of honor. I mean, those who, who men talked about their honor um, you know, there were certain things expected of men, certain things expected of women, I mean, that, that, that affected women's honor and, and men's honor. I think in particular social classes, um, landed aristocracy, landed gentry, many of whose members were still very important in providing the sorts of people who went into foreign offices and into the upper levels of the government more generally, or, and, in, and, and, and who became army officers, the notion of honor was, was a very live one. And there was a lot of concern that you could lose your honor if someone insulted you, for example, and you didn't respond properly, you were dishonored. And there was actually, in most European countries, an increase in dueling before the First World War, and very elaborate handbooks written about when you should accept, an, an, a, when, when you should accept a challenge. Um, you could also dishonor yourself by accepting a challenge from someone who was not worthy of your fighting that person. And it seems to me that those sort of notions of honor, that honor is something very precious, that can be damaged, that you have to protect, that you will be shamed if you don't protect your honor, whether you're a man or a woman, was something that people often transposed to the nation state. And so you get statesmen saying, you know, we must do this because the honor of the country is at stake. Um, in Russia before 19, in 1914, as the crisis began to really get worse, you've got people in St. Petersburg which was then the capital, saying Russia will lose its honor if it doesn't defend Serbia. Russia will not be able to hold up its head among nations. Um, Sir Edward Grey, when he went to the House of Commons on August the 4th, 1914, to say that he felt and, and his government felt that it, you know, they were going to have to intervene in the conflict in Europe, said, we have obligations of honor. And so I do think it, it's, a, it's an important term and to try and get at what that means, to try and work out what that meant for people. And today, nations talk about prestige and credibility, and I suspect in some ways it's a bit the same, but this notion of honor, I think, is something really interesting. So do you think that honor still plays a role in international affairs today? I think honor probably does, and in, in, it's just that people don't use the language of honor so much. But when you get an, an American Secretary of State saying the credibility of the United States is at stake, my sense is that is something about honor, that the, you know, that the United States um, has to be seen to behave in particular ways. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, the Americans, I think, take very seriously the notion that their state is a state unlike others, which does hold itself to higher standards. And often in the internal political debate in the United States, you get people saying, you know, the government has shamed the United States, and the government is not worthy of the United States. I mean, the sense that the United States represents a higher moral purpose in the world. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret. That was excellent, really informative, oh, thank you. Oh, not at all, thank you.